In April 2017, AMD launched the Ryzen series of processors. There was certainly a lot of hype leading up to the launch. Eight cores, 16 threads, but there was a question, and the most crucial question of all, how would AMD be able to compare with Intel and the then current Kaby Lake series of processors? The answer, of course, was very favorably, with the 1600 and 1700 CPUs stealing much of the 7600K and the 7700K's limelight. Intel have since responded with Coffee Lake S, six cores, 12 threads now for the mainstream, with, at the time of my recording this, the eight core Coffee Lakes on their way. But AMD have not been caught with their pants down, and have, of course, updated from the 14nm process to the 12nm Zen Plus. This has brought numerous changes, support for faster memory, improvements with boosting and frequencies, and also lower cache latencies and improved core bandwidth. But there is one question. How much of an IPC gain do you get from a Zen to a Zen Plus processor? And is it worth an upgrade? In this video, we're gonna be investigating this by pitting the 1700X against the 2700X at numerous clock speeds. The first is three gigahertz, the second is four gigahertz, and finally letting the chips run at auto. Crucially, this will allow us to see IPC gains between the two generations and a true representation of the actual performance difference between the CPUs if left to their own devices. To clarify, IPC is not the only measure of performance increase between one generation to the other. Of course, with Zen Plus, the processor is capable of boosting and sustaining higher clock frequencies when more threads are in play, which is certainly going to improve performance across numerous workloads. But our goal is to also see how much of an improvement AMD have managed to deliver from one processor generation to the other. According to AMD's own documentation, they believe that they've managed to achieve around a 3% IPC improvement from Zen to Zen Plus. So let's see if they have managed to deliver this. So on to testing methodologies and setup. We have a Ryzen 7 1700X and a Ryzen 7 2700X. The motherboard is an MSI X470 Gaming Plus, which was provided to us by MSI, but has since gone back, just for full disclosure. The graphics card is a GeForce GTX 1080, and we have Crucial Ballistics Tactical Elite Memory, uh, 3000 megahertz, but we're running it at 2866 for this video, and of course, Windows 10 patched to the latest version. Do note that we're conducting all of our gaming tests at 1080p. This is, of course, to push more load onto the CPU and to take the GPU further out of the equation. So let's start things out with Geekbench. We can immediately see that the 2700X and 1700X separate themselves. In particular, the auto results do show that the 2700X is much more aggressive when it comes to managing its clock frequencies. But the primary focus of this video, of course, is IPC and the tests do show a slight improvement on both single and multi-core scores with the 2700X. Admittedly, the results are not massively improved, with the 2700X achieving around 100 points advantage over the 1700X with single core performance, and around a 400 point advantage with multi-core performance, but still, there is definitely an advantage there. These results are closely mirrored in Cinebench R15, with a couple of points advantage in the single core score of the 2700X, either at 4 GHz or 3 GHz. But in the multi-core score, we can also see the same type of performance advantage for the 2700X. So, so far, so good. AMD are managing to achieve their claims of a few percent IPC improvement. These results are also mirrored in Corona, with the 2700X finishing the render in seven seconds faster than the 1700X. So what about Sysoft Sandra? Sysoft Sandra is a very interesting benchmark because it allows us to test out different facets of the processor, including how fast one processor core can speak to another processor core, which is particularly of interest in the Ryzen architecture. Starting things out with the Sysoft Sandra multi-core test, we can see that intercore bandwidth and latency are definitely improved from one series of processors to the other. And while the results at 4 GHz of 1.2 NS doesn't sound like a big deal, don't forget that in some applications and benchmarks, this can be a rather large saving in performance. The multi-thread results of Sysoft Sandra closely mirror that of the multi-core. However, 
we can once again see that if left to its own devices, the 2700X is considerably faster than the 1700X if set to auto. This is because of the reasons we've already discussed. Improvements in clock speed frequencies from one generation to the other, sure, but perhaps the most crucial thing of all, the fact that you have XFR2 and other improvements to the boost frequencies allows the CPU to maintain a higher and more stable frequency when more threads are at play, delivering a more consistent level of performance. So the key takeaway so far is in synthetic and 3D rendering results, yes, the 2700X is slightly faster, particularly left to its own devices with auto. But what about gains? Well, the most important aspect for us to take into consideration when discussing the performance of games is, of course, the GPU. Quite frequently, you are going to be GPU bound in a situation. Yes, if you're really behind in the CPU race, then of course you may get stutter in your games or slightly worse performance, but almost universally, if you're playing to the monitor's maximum capable resolution or you're downsampling and putting on all the graphical bells and whistles that your graphics card can afford, typically you are going to be GPU bound. Now remember, we are testing with a GeForce GTX 1080 at only 1080p. And even still, we often find that the difference between uh, game results is quite marginal. And just to illustrate this point further, we have released a couple of videos before, one that testing modes and how even disabling many CPU cores doesn't necessarily impact game performance until you start to just go to around four cores. You can find a link for that in the video description and also the impact of memory speeds on game and synthetic results. And you can also find that linked in the video description as well. Let's start things out with Firestrike. Once again, the auto results of the 2700X clearly dominate that of the 1700X, but if we were to look at the results of the 1700X 4 GHz on the physics score, it manages to achieve 20,992. The 2700X at 4 GHz scores just slightly higher at 21,071. How about Rise of the Tomb Raider then? Perhaps one of the most popular benchmarks out there. We are conducting our tests once again at 1080p, and you can see that largely the results are almost identical across the board, but almost within margin of error. In fact, even the 3 GHz results are still over 130 frames per second, and there's not that much difference per going an additional 1000 MHz. So crucially, we can see that even the 4 GHz results of the 2700X only provide 143.67 frames per second. This is once again a demonstration that a 1080p Rise of the Tomb Raider with all the graphical bells and whistles is without a question GPU bound quite frequently. In fact, in our mode testing video, we did demonstrate that until you switch to just 720p, the results are quite similar across the board. Switching to Hitman 2016, you are CPU bound at 3 GHz, as you would probably expect, but it doesn't take long before the GPU starts to become the limiting factor. With all of those graphical effects, Hitman is a very demanding game. So when you start hitting the 4 GHz mark, then there isn't that much difference between the results and it almost becomes an intangible. DualSex, and yes, if you're running at 3 GHz, your performance is certainly gonna suffer, as you would expect, but IPC performance, of the 2700X doesn't make a noticeable difference here with around two frames per second advantage with the 2700X's newer silicon. The 1700X and 2700X, however, at four gigahertz, there is a smaller difference because once again, the GPU is becoming the limiting factor. And Batman Arkham Knight, with its single thread performance and doesn't push as many threads, we are most certainly hitting the GPU limit once again. Ashes of the Singularity is a curious case, with the CPU results of Ashes of the Singularity definitely showing an advantage of the Ryzen 2700X, but when the GPU results come in, it is a much tighter race. And honestly, in those instances, the GPU certainly becomes a more limiting factor once again, the same on story. So what's the key takeaway here? What can we learn from all of this? Well, AMD have managed to hit the performance targets that they have stated of 3% IPC improvements from Zen to Zen Plus. So that's absolutely fantastic. But of course, this is with a caveat. If you're gaming at 1080p, even on a GTX 1080, in many instances, you're gonna be so GPU bound if all the graphical effects are on, you're probably not gonna notice that too much other than a few FPS here or there. But if you are running at lower resolutions, which is very unlikely, or you are running synthetic results, 3D rendering and stuff, then without a question, 
you will notice a small impact in performance assuming you're running at the same clock speed but and this is the crux of the matter you're most likely not going to be running your 1700x and 2700x at exactly identical clock speeds even if you let the chips manage themselves the 2700x is going to tend to run faster than the previous generation and if you're manually clocking then by all means you're going to get a couple of hundred megahertz at minimum from one generation to the other from my own personal silicon experience and once again this is from a small sample size my 1700x my own personal 1700x hits around the 4000 megahertz 4050 ish at best with the sample that we were given from msi uh, with the uh, x470 board I managed to hit 4200 megahertz without too much tweaking at all that was very simple so right away that's 150 megahertz and i'm very confident i could have gotten to 4300 megahertz pretty consistently if i'd have put more time to tweak the voltages in other words there is a lot more room left in the tank so of course that's also critical plus memory speeds as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, we're running the RAM at 2,866 megahertz, and there is an important reason for this. The 1700X refused to play ball on an X470 motherboard at higher speeds, whereas the 2700X, we hit 3,266 megahertz with no issues, and this is with RAM, which is only rated at 3,000 megahertz. So, of course, faster memory speeds equal higher performance. But with all of that said, it is important to at least give AMD some credit. They did manage to hit the performance targets that they stated, which is obviously a good thing. And I'm gonna be very uh, interested to see what type of improvements in performance we're gonna see with the Zen 2 architecture, which supposedly will see all around improvements, major improvements in IPC, and of course, improvements in clock speed as well. With all of that said, normal stuff, if you like the video, well, click the like button. Do feel free to subscribe and click the bell icon as well. We are also on Patreon, which you can find linked in the video description. If you do choose to give us a small bit of support, that would be greatly appreciated. But with all of that said, take care of yourselves. Bye for now.